Welcome back to the Jongets Games playthrough for Stronghold Undead. At this point, we have played through one full round of the game in a tutorial video, where I also taught most of the rules to the game. Now, if you missed that, you can find a link for it down below in the description, or you can click the I up there in the top corner for it. And just like always, I'd like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. That way, if I make mistakes as we play through the rest of this game, I can then put corrections on the screen, and that will make this as accurate as possible. All right, let's now jump back into it. At this point, we are now starting the second out of a potential eight rounds in the game, and the first thing we have to do is the supplies phase. So we're going to start off by looking to the second round spot, and this is going to give the invading player five more mana. Now you'll notice they actually had four mana remaining from the last round, which means they're going to go into the preparation phase with more mana than they did in the first round. Next up, as the defenders, we get two of these time tokens, and we can put them down right over here. We don't use these just yet, we'll get to that later on in the supplies phase. Next up, the invader can choose to draw a mana card if they want, and they have decided to do this. Now this one is going to give them one extra mana, and it's going to give us an extra time. Next up, the invader can choose to activate the Altar of Death. Now remember, every two of the units they remove from here is going to give them one more mana, and if they activate this at all, then us as the defender will get one more time. Now at this point, the invader decides they don't want to activate this just yet, so they're just going to leave these on here for a potential activation in the future. Next up, the invader can optionally activate the Necromancer's Library. So they can look through all of these spells right here, and if they want to, they can rearrange these spells in their spell tome. Of course, if they do any of this, then we as the defender will get one time. Now they have decided they do want to bring out one new spell, and that one is going to be Poisonous Clouds. Now we can see that this costs them one mana to put the Poisonous Cloud token down, and it adds two to the total strength on that wall section when it is activated. Now when they place this out into the spell tome, they of course have to replace one of the other ones out here, and they feel like they want to get another Path of the Damned activation in, so instead they're going to get rid of the Phantom Gale. Now this one is pretty nice, you can spend one mana to move up to two of your units from one single location, but they've decided they're okay with the maneuvers that are coming later on, and they'd rather have the Poisonous Cloud activate. Now at this point, if they wanted to, they could also rearrange these spells because, of course, they activate from the left over to the right, but at the moment they're feeling pretty okay with this order. So we're going to get one time token because they did activate that Necromancer's Tome. And at this point, we can now spend our time. Now in the first round of the game, we had 10 time at this point, which seemed great overall. Unfortunately, things are not looking quite as solid for us. Now we know that our opponent is very likely to spend a bunch of mana, so we're going to get more time from that. And I kind of feel like maybe we should start off by just spending two time to get rid of each one of these uh, bone piles here, and then we can spend the other two to activate this malfunction. Now that lets us put this token down onto any one of the siege weapons, and let's put it down on top of this bone thrower, and that will stop it from activating, so uh, hypothetically that's less bone piles we have to deal with on the next round. Alright, we can now go into the second phase of the round, which is preparation. Now the invader gets to start casting spells from their tome here, and they're going to start over here by spending one of their mana to put a poisonous cloud token down onto the board. Well, we can see that they have three of these tokens total, so they'll put one of them out now. And when it comes out to the board, it will have an activation token on it as part of the build cost. Now, they've decided to put this one right over here. You'll notice that most of the wall sections have two spots in them that match up for these invader-style tokens. Now, that means that they can never put another token on this location, but it also means that they are likely bulking up to try and break through this weak point. Again, as I said before, only two of our defending units can hang out over here, and that's going to increase their strength on this section by two, which is a bit worrisome. Now that that's built, we of course get one time because they spent one mana on that, and we can activate something over here in the keep. Well, with the fact that these units are threatening us over here, I think let's put this down over here onto the sortie action. Now we have to put another time over here to activate this, and when this activates, we can destroy three skeletons from any one rampart. Currently, there are just three skeletons on this rampart, so I think with our next time, we're going to take those out. Okay, the invading player can keep casting spells, and they currently have 9 more mana, so it looks like they're going to do quite a bit of stuff. Now, they're going to spend 2 mana in order to create another bone-throwing siege weapon. Next up, they have to put this into an empty rampart location, and they'll put it right over there. Now, they of course have to build the siege deck for that. This is going to be 2 of the hit cards, as well as 4 of the miss cards, and then all of those can get shuffled up. After this, we know they spent two mana, so we get two more time that we can spend, and that's going to happen immediately. 
Now I talked about activating sortie before, so let's go ahead and do that. We can put this right over here and that activates this ability, which again destroys three skeletons from any one of the ramparts. So let's target this one over here. And then all three of these killed skeletons will go to the altar of death. All right, we have one more time left available and I think let's start working on another cannon. Next up, the invader can spend one of their mana to activate the Path of the Damned, and that lets them put another one of these tokens out on the board. In this case, they're going to put it right over here, so it appears that they are probably going to be pushing a lot of phantoms to this side of the board, considering they can now convert two of them into skeletons when they cross over these paths. Next up, we get one time for the one mana spent, and let's put this over here on the cannon, so we're just one time away from completing it. Okay, the invader's going to move along, and this turn they are going to spend three of their mana to create a Spectral Ballista Siege Weapon. So they can put this down into one of the empty Rampart spots, and they have to build another Siege deck for this. Now this works the same way as the Bone Throwers, they take two of the hits, and they will take four of these misses right here. And it's worth noting that these Spectral Ballista are actually good at knocking out our Marksmen on the walls that are connected to that location. So it appears they are hoping to maybe do some damage to us on this spot. Uh, it certainly seems like they are bulking up to hit the right hand side of our keep more than the left side. Now I'll explain how this works in greater detail once we get to that part of this round. So we get three time tokens because that Spectral Ballista took a while to be built. And with the first of these, let's complete a cannon. Now we have just two of these left, and we have one cannon over on this part of the board already, and it does seem like our uh, invading opponent is bulking up over here, so I think let's put this cannon down onto this spot there. That way it can target all three of these ramparts as well as this foreground. At this point we still have two time left, and I think let's use one of that time to activate this priest in the courtyard. That's going to give us one two morale to bump this panic track down twice. And then with our last time, I think let's go over here and construct a wall. Now, as you can see, we have five wall segments that we can construct throughout this game. And each wall increases the strength of a wall segment by one. So let's put this right over here because we can see that the invader is really bulking up to try and take this spot on. So we've stacked that up, which has increased the defense for this area permanently by one. Next up, the invading player decides they are not going to cast another graveyard spell, but they are going to create another marsh, which is going to cost them two of their mana. So they can pick an empty rampart to put this down into, and as you can see, they've been bulking up pretty strong, and they only have two options left. Now, they want to leave this one flexible to potentially put a spectral ballista in it next turn, so they're going to put the marsh right over here, and of course, since it was just summoned, it comes in with an activation token on it. Well, this means we get two time tokens that we can use immediately. And I think let's build a Consecrated Ground token. Now, I briefly mentioned this in the tutorial. We have three of them, and we can put this out onto a matching spot on one of the ramparts. Well, it seems to me like our opponent is really bulking up to come over here. So let's put the Consecrated Ground onto that spot. Now, at the start of melee combat, this will destroy the strongest unit within this rampart. So that is something that the invading player has to deal with for the rest of the game. Now we do have two more of these Consecrated Ground Tokens, and that's part of the reason I wanted to get this out now, so that we could use them as early as possible. Alright, the invading player is now done casting spells, so now they have the option of activating a variety of different effects. Now they've decided to spend one mana and activate all of their marshes, and currently one has a token on it, and the other one doesn't. So they're effectively spending one mana to activate a single marsh this turn. And that one is right out here. Obviously, this is the one they built in the first round of the game. Now, at this point, they are done with their activations, so they can move on to the grounds step, which means all of their activated grounds will now do their actions. Now, they decided not to activate this graveyard over here, so our panic level is not going to go up once. So I certainly like the look of that, but then both of these marshes are activated, and each marsh gives them two more mana. So they can put four mana into their pool. Alright, it's now time for the invader's maneuver step. They have to start this by drawing 14 new units out of the bag. So these are all the new minions they get to use, and of course there were these two phantoms that were held over from the previous round. Now at this point they can do their maneuvers, they can do a minor and or a major, and of course they can do this in any order of their choice. Well, it looks like they're going to start with a minor maneuver. This is going to give us three time, and they can move six units from every rampart out, and then they can move six units from each foreground to ramparts, and finally six units from the camp to each one of the foregrounds. So they can come back out to the map, and they don't have that many units. We were able to take out three skeletons from this right-hand side, which was a pretty good thing for us as the defenders. 
Well, they can still move up to six units from each one of these ramparts, and they've decided to take all three of these from here, and they'll move them down this slot onto this wall segment. Next up, they're going to move this single vampire over to this location over here. Next up, they can move up to six units from each foreground, and they're going to start by moving a single phantom down this path to that rampart. Now, when it crosses over this path of the damned token, it upgrades itself into a skeleton, and it's worth noting that each one of these path of the damned tokens can be used once per maneuver. So they're now going to send all five of these down this path to this rampart, and that means that uh, token here will turn this phantom into another skeleton. Next up, they can move up to six from the left-hand foreground, and they've decided to take all six of these and move them down this path into this rampart. The last thing they have to do for this minor maneuver is move six units from the camp into each one of the foregrounds. Well, it looks like they're going to send two vampires and four of these phantoms over to the right-hand side. And then they're going to send two vampires, two of the phantoms, and two skeletons to the left-hand side. After this, they have decided they are going to do a major maneuver. Obviously, they don't have that many of these units back at camp, but they do want to advance the units out on the board over to the walls to really put the pressure on. So this works just like the minor maneuver, but they get to move eight at each step. And they're going to start over here on the right side. Now they know during the melee phase of the game that the strongest unit in this uh, overall rampart will be destroyed. So they don't want to leave anything over here. Now with that in mind, they're going to move four down this path over to this wall segment right here. And then they're going to move this fifth one down to this lower rampart. Now, this is the only way to get access to these areas right over here, and as you can see, there currently is not a pairing of marksmen up along these walls, so they're not too worried about this being volleyed at, although of course we are about to get a bunch of time on our hands, which could help us with taking out the skeleton with a volley. Next up, they can move up to eight units out of this rampart, and they're going to send four of these along that path to this lower section. These uh, two skeletons are going to head down to this path, going over to this upper wall area, and you'll notice this spot can only take four enemy units, so they have currently capped that out. Of course, they could also take up to three phantoms, but it looks like that was not in the mix for them this turn. It looks like the last rampart with units is right up here, and they've decided not to send this lone skeleton out to one of these spots where it would probably just be killed. Next up, they can move up to eight units from each foreground, and it looks like they have decided that they're going to send a single one of these phantoms across that path of the dead. That is going to turn into a skeleton. And actually, they're going to move the rest of these down that same path going over to this spot. That does mean they're not using this path of the dead uh, token here, but they can see that this consecrated ground would just kill one of the enemies that went onto that spot, so they've decided to uh, bolster over here. Over here on the left, they've decided to send all of these down at that path into this rampart. And now they can put all of these units down into the two foregrounds. Now obviously they don't have that many because they did do a double maneuver this turn, but it felt important to them to really start pressuring the castle walls. Now in this case, they're just going to balance things out, I think. They're going to put two skeletons over here and two skeletons over there. And that has finished out the invader part of the maneuver phase. Now at this point, uh, us as the defender can spend time. We know that we're going to get three time for the minor maneuver and five time for the major one. We also don't get any bonuses for units left in the camp because obviously there aren't any. So let's take eight time and we have to immediately spend it. And the first thing I think we should do is create a skeleton cauldron. Now we only have three of these total and we can build it onto the circular cauldron spots on the walls. And I think putting it right over there is going to help us out. Every cauldron will destroy one skeleton from that section each one of the melee rounds, so that means there is one less skeleton we need to deal with in this area. Next up, let's spend one time to do a swap action. We can take this veteran here from the barracks and swap it with this soldier. So the soldier goes back to the barracks, and you'll notice over here we now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 defense, and the invader is going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 offense. That means there is a difference of two, but as I said in the tutorial, you don't actually uh, persist with damage. So that means they would do two damage to a veteran, but it takes three damage to kill them off. So this is uh, essentially perfect for us to be able to defend this without overcommitting. Next up, let's head over to the cathedral and activate the exorcism ability. That takes two of our time, and it lets us target any one of the vampires out on the board, and we immediately turn it into a phantom. So we're going to target this one right over here. And we can put the phantom back over here, and it's worth noting that the phantom does do one plus an additional damage because there is still a vampire in this section, but that still lowered the overall damage in this area by one. 
Next up, I think let's spend two time to train this soldier into a veteran, and then we can spend this last time to swap this veteran out with the soldier in the section. Now, I would prefer to swap out with one of the marksmen, but you'll notice the barracks is already full with marksmen, so we probably should have tried to get those out there. Maybe there is some other way we could have spent our time better, but this is the uh, situation we are in. So we can swap this over here, and that soldier will head over to the barracks. And with that, we are now ready for the assault phase of the round, and we start with ranged combat. Now, our cannons will go first. We can draw the top card from the deck, and it looks like this cannon was able to hit a phantom, a uh, skeleton, or a vampire. Now, we had to choose our target destination first, but obviously the only targets are this rampart. So I figure let's destroy this vampire. Next up, this cannon will attack that rampart, and when we draw the top card, it lets us take out a skeleton or a phantom. Now, considering there are a couple of vampires over here, that means the phantoms do the same damage as the skeletons, and those phantoms can levitate, so I think we will actually destroy a phantom. So, we are now done with the cannons, and we can shuffle these cards back into the deck, and at this point, our crossbow on the right-hand side will activate. We can see it's over here, and its only good target is on that rampart. Remember, crossbows just target vampires, so we can draw the top card, and that is a hit. So that means we have destroyed one vampire from this rampart. Next up, the invading player can activate their Spectral Ballista, and it targets a wall section that is adjacent to that rampart. Now, they have decided to target this area because the Ballista can only kill off Marksmen. The way this works is if they get a hit, then they will first of all kill the strongest invading unit in that area, and then if there is a Marksman, that Marksman will die, and a Phantom will take its place out here on the wall. So even though the invader does lose a unit, it's still pretty good for them overall because uh, we lose units and it's a lot easier for the invading player to get more units out, especially considering that marksman turns into a phantom that hurts us. Now in this case, they can draw and they got a miss. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, it's also worth noting, if that was a hit, we would have taken a panic, but in this case, that miss will simply be removed from that siege deck. It's now time for our marksmen to do their volley ability. Now remember, this is if we have two marksmen within a wall segment, and it does not have any melee uh, enemy units in it. Now as we can see, that only applies to these two marksmen over here, and they can kill off a skeleton in one of the adjacent ramparts, but it looks like the uh, invader was able to dodge that. So no volleys are going to happen which means it's now time for the melee phase of the assault. Now, every priest is going to repel one phantom from the associated area. Uh, it seems like this priest does not have any phantoms to hit, and then every consecrated ground will destroy the strongest unit in that rampart. Now, the invading player was once again able to dodge that over here, and the last thing that we get to do is the skeleton cauldrons, which will destroy one skeleton from that associated area. Now, this is going to go to the altar of death. Next up, we would evaluate any stakes that were built, but we have not done that yet. So finally, we can go wall section by wall section to evaluate how that melee combat goes. So let's start over here, and it looks like the invaders have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 strength from these units, and then 8, 9 strength from this phantom because that vampire increases its strength by 1. Now as a defense, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that means the invading player has 2 more strength, and they are going to do 2 damage. Now, they get to decide how the damage is dealt, and unfortunately, they've decided to kill off both of these marksmen, because again, every unit has an amount of health equal to its strength. So, those will head over to the hospital, and now we can check this spot. Now, we can see the invading player has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 strength coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that means they are going to do 3 damage, which is, again, pretty bad for us. Uh, that's going to kill off the soldier and this marksman right here. And uh, so far, the second round of the game is going a lot worse than the first round did. These are going to head over to the hospital. Lastly, we have this assault, and it looks like the invaders are coming in with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 strength. And for defense, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that means they will do 2 damage to us, but they need 3 damage to kill a veteran, so none of these units will die. Well, the melee attacks are done, so now we can come to the hospital, and one of these units can go back to the courtyard, plus 1 for every hospital bed that we put over here. Now, it looks like we probably should have built another hospital bed at some time this round. Unfortunately, that means just 2 of these units will survive. They're going to head over to the courtyard, and these other 2 are removed from the board. 
At this point, we can now evaluate the panic track, and it looks like it did not go up at all this round. We proactively sent it down by two, and that did cost us this one time token. And in retrospect, I realized we should have waited until we actually took some panic damage, and we could have spent this token putting out another hospital bed, which would have been a much better use of that time. But it looks like we were not playing this one super well in this round. Hopefully the next round will go better. Obviously, we will not draw any panic cards, and then this can reset back to zero. Well, it's now time for the cleanup phase, and the first thing we do is move the round token over. Next up, we can reset all of the spells over here in the invader's spell tome. And then every one of the invader's activation cubes can get removed from their tokens. After this, we can remove all of the time tokens from completed actions. It looks like we currently don't have any uncomplete actions, so all of these will be removed. The last thing we have to do is move the temporary tokens back over to their associated spots, and at this point we have finished out the second round, so we can go into the third round of the game. So let's start things off with the supply phase, and that means the invading player is going to get three mana, and we're going to get two time tokens. Next up, the invader can optionally draw a mana card, and they're going to, and it looks like that's going to give them two more mana, and we are going to get a time token from it. Moving on, the invader can activate the Altar of Death, and they've decided they're going to do that. We can see that for every two units they get rid of, they're going to get one mana, so that is six units gone, which gives them three more mana to play with, and because they activated this, we will get one more time token. Next up, they have the option of activating their Necromancer's Tome, and it looks like they have decided to do that, and they're going to bring in three new spells. Now this of course means they need to get rid of three spells from their tome, and considering there's just one rampart section that does not have something built in it already, they've decided to replace the bone thrower as well as the spectral ballista and this graveyard. Now it appears they're planning on putting a marsh into that last empty rampart spot, and now to fill those three spots in, they're going to put down mists, old friends return, as well as totems. Now I'll explain what these new spells do very soon once they start getting activated, and of course us as the defender gets one time token because they used their Necromancer's Tome. At this point, it's now time for us to spend our time, and we have five of these tokens to spend. Now things did not go very well for us on the left-hand side of the castle in the last round, so I certainly think we should probably do something about that. Now one thing we could do is a sortie action, and that would destroy three skeletons from one rampart, but unfortunately it looks like there's no way to use all three. This rampart has two skeletons in it, and up here there are two skeletons on that rampart, so no matter what we would not be using this to its full extent, although we would still be removing four strength overall, which is still a pretty good use of time. Now I think for the moment, let's use two of our time to actually construct a footbridge. Now I haven't talked about these just yet, these go down onto one of the empty footbridge spots on the board, and I think we should put it right here. Now once there is a footbridge down, you can freely move units back and forth over that for the rest of the game. The reason I think this is a good idea is because we have two soldiers down on the spot, and so far the invader does not seem like they've been pushing any other units to this area. So that will let us for free move both of the soldiers along this footbridge in order to fill up these two spots. Next up, I figure let's use these two time tokens to activate the Saint. Now the way this works is we can put this down onto any one rampart, and units will not be able to leave that rampart. Uh, maybe we should have used this last round, but either way, this round I think if we put the Saint right over here, that is very much going to help us out in this part of the castle, because obviously we got hit pretty hard there in the last round. So this means none of these units can leave this rampart, so that gives us a little bit of a reprieve. Well, we have one more time token, and part of me wants to create a hospital bed, because obviously we suffered pretty big casualties last round, but I have a feeling that this round might be a bit of a calm before the next storm. With that in mind, I think we should probably keep training up some of these people over here. Let's use one time to help train towards a soldier. That will open up one of these spots, so we could potentially swap one of the other marksmen into that location for one of the better trained units in the barracks later on in this round. Well, we've now entered the preparation phase of the round, and that means the invading player can start casting spells. Now, they're going to start by spending one of their mana to put down a Poisonous Cloud token, and they've decided to put it right over here. Now, that adds two to their strength when it is activated, and it, of course, comes into play activated. With that placed, we, of course, get one time because they spent one mana, and let's use that over here to complete training a soldier. So that's going to turn one of these marksmen into a soldier, that can head onto this spot, and of course we can clear out these time tokens. Moving on, the invading player is now going to cast the Mist spell. 
that is going to cost them two of their mana, and they can then place one of these tokens out onto one of the ramparts. In this case, they've selected that rampart, and you'll notice that each rampart has only two spots open for this shape of token. Now, the mist when activated allows the invading player to move one unit to that rampart and one unit away from that rampart as part of their maneuver phase. Well, that costs them two mana, so we get two time. And I think let's get another Consecrated Ground built out. So we can place this onto a Rampart, and I figure we'll put it onto this Rampart, considering none of these units can leave. So that is essentially guaranteed to kill off this Vampire, and I certainly like the idea of that. Moving on, the Invader is going to activate Path of the Damned. That's going to cost one mana, and they can then place their last token for this out on the board. After considering their options, they're going to put it right up here and then we get another time to play with. Now, I think let's just go ahead and use this to build another hospital bed. I'm regretting not doing that last round, and I'm not sure if we're going to take that many casualties this round, but I do want to make sure that we get all three of these built up before the next big attack happens, and that might be next turn, but either way, this lets us prepare for it. After this, the invading player can now activate Old Friend's Return. Now, this is going to cost them two mana, and it says they immediately place up to four skeletons from the supply onto any one empty rampart. Well, they've decided to put this over here, and then we get two time tokens for the two mana spent, and I think let's just activate Sortie. That lets us destroy three skeletons from any one rampart. We considered doing that earlier in the round, and I'm glad we didn't, because now we can kill off all three of these right here. Now, all three will go to the Altar of Death, so that means they'll turn into more mana later on. So overall, I think that was a net positive for the Invader, although it was not quite as scary as it looked just a second ago. Next up, the Invading player has decided to cast Totems. Now, this is going to cost them one mana, and they can then put this Totem token out onto one of the Ramparts. Well, after looking at their options, they've decided to put this right over here, and you'll notice that this token does not have an activation symbol on it. That means this is always active, and the totem means every time we have any of our units get killed and sent to the hospital, then immediately one skeleton will appear in this rampart. So obviously that is a little bit scary. It's definitely going to allow the invading player to bolster up more resources once uh, people get killed. Obviously they're feeling like maybe they should have done that last turn considering four people were killed, but either way, they're pretty happy to get this out now. Well, that totem did cost one mana, so we can now place one of our time tokens. And I think let's just spend it building out a wall. Now we can put that one right over here, and that increases the defense of that area by one. Well, we've now come to the last invader spell, and they have decided to spend two of their mana, and that will let them put their final marsh out onto the board. Of course, that comes into play with an activation token on it, and now we can see that every one of the rampart locations has either a siege engine on it or a ground tile. Well, the invading player spent two mana putting that marsh down, so now we can spend two time. And I think let's activate the trap spot. Now, this lets us put a trap out onto any one of the open uh, path locations on the board. And I think at this point, we should probably put this right over here. Now, the way the trap works is the uh, invader cannot send units over this trap unless they send at least four strength of units over it. And then the trap will activate. It'll be discarded from that spot back to here, and it will do four damage to those units. Now, this is a pretty good way to kind of stem some of the issues that we've been having over here. Uh, it looks like we have some pretty good veterans on the spot, but considering we cannot put any more units over here, we have to make sure that the invader does not come in with a bunch more units this turn. All right, the invader is done with the spells, so now they can spend mana on activation. This first mana will activate all of their marshes, and that's going to put two tokens out. The second mana will activate their one cemetery, and this third mana will activate one of their poison clouds. So they can put these tokens right out here, and they've now finished out the activation step, so now they can go into the ground step. Now this uh, will activate all of their marshes that have tokens on them, so that's going to be giving them two, four, six more mana, and their cemetery will increase our panic level by one. So they have six mana over here in their pool, and it's now time to move into the maneuver phase. This means the invader's going to draw 14 units out of the bag, and it looks like this is what they found. So the invader can now do a major or minor maneuver, and they've decided to go with minor, which means they can move up to six units from each rampart. Now they're going to start by moving all five of these units down that path over to this wall section. Of course, two of these are levitating phantoms. And then next, they would love to move units out of this rampart, but this saint token is stopping that from happening. 
Now they do have one skeleton down here and they've decided, well, they could send it over here or they could send it into this spot. That can take up to four units and they think that is probably gonna be a good idea. Next up, they have a single skeleton over here and they're gonna send it down that path to fill this area up. It can take five enemy units and now there are five in here. Next up, they can move up to six units from each foreground and they're gonna send these two over here to that rampart and over here in the top right, They've decided to send these skeletons along that path to this rampart. Now, lastly, they can bring out six units into each one of the foregrounds. And they've decided to go with four phantoms and two skeletons in the top right. And then three vampires, two phantoms, and one skeleton in the top left. Well, that's finished out their minor maneuver, and they've decided not to do a major maneuver, but they can now also activate all of their missed actions. Now, this lets them move one unit into this rampart and one unit out of it, so they're going to use this phantom that's going to head down this path, and that will turn into a skeleton, and then they can move this out of that path over to either this area or that rampart. Now, they can't go over to this area because they have to push at least four damage worth of units through this trap, so they're just going to send this over to that far-flung rampart. You may have noticed the only way to get here is through another rampart, and we certainly don't like the look of units down here, especially considering this totem will summon more skeletons in this bottom right corner whenever we have units die. Now that the invader is done with their maneuvers, we get three time to spend because they only did that minor maneuver, and we don't get any bonus time because they just have two units left over in their camp. Now, at this point, I would love to activate the Malfunction token, but we have some pretty weak spots around our walls. Currently, we would just lose the game if we had an Assault over here, and we would also take a lot of damage from this location if we were to go through with that. Now, I think this means we should spend our time rearranging units. And let's begin by spending one time to pull this soldier from the courtyard over to that wall segment. Next up, let's spend another one of our time to move this soldier over to that adjacent wall area. Well, we have one time left, and I think let's use it to move this priest from the courtyard up to that segment here. That's going to add two strength to the area, and that will also banish one of the phantoms, which should help us out a bit. All right, it's now time to move into the assault phase, and we can start with this cannon, and let's have it target this rampart. Now we can draw the top card, and that's going to hit either a phantom or a skeleton. And considering there are a lot of vampires going on over here, I think let's take out a phantom, because uh, those can levitate, and obviously the vampires make them do two damage anyway. Next up, we have one more cannon, and let's have it target this rampart, and it looks like that is going to hit a phantom or a skeleton. Now there's just skeletons over here, so that was a bit risky. If this had just shown a phantom, then we would not have actually removed anything. Next up, this crossbow could activate, but it only takes down vampires, and there are no vampires for it to target. This means it's now time for the siege engines to activate, and unfortunately, we did not find a way to spend time to put a malfunction token out. So we can start with the bone throwers. This one got a miss, so I suppose that's good for now, although that means that's one less miss that it has in its deck. Uh, then we have this bone thrower, and that's also a miss. Okay, so far things are going pretty well for us as far as these siege engines are concerned. And then over here, this one is going to target that wall segment. Now it can reveal the top card, and that's also a miss. So uh, I guess overall that was good this round, although each one of these siege engines will be much more likely to hit in the future. After that, our marksmen can do their volley ability, and again, that will kill off one skeleton from an attached rampart to a wall section with two of the marksmen that are not engaged. Now that's currently just these two here, but there are no skeletons to kill, so this means we can now move on to the melee phase of combat. Now the first thing that we can do is have each one of the priests repel one phantom from that wall segment. There is no phantom over here, but there is on this spot, so that phantom is going to get pushed back to its associated rampart. Next up, each one of our Consecrated Grounds will activate. There is no unit to kill over here, but over here there are a few. And again, this kills off the strongest unit there, so that's going to kill this vampire. Next up, we can have our Skeleton Cauldrons activate. We just have one of them deployed, and that's going to kill this skeleton. Next up, we would activate any stakes that were out here, but we have not invested in those just yet. So it's now time to go into the melee strength phase around the wall. Now we can start on this section here. And there is a lot of strength coming in. Now the enemy has plus 2 from this poison cloud. Then they get 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now again, this phantom does plus 1 because there is a vampire in this area. And now we can look to our defense. Now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that means 3 damage is coming in. 
Now, the invading player gets to decide how this damage will be dealt, and unfortunately, they've decided to kill off this veteran. So that'll head to the hospital, and now we can go to this wall segment. Now there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 strength coming in, and as far as defense is concerned, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That means the invaders will do 1 damage, and that's going to kill off this marksman. Next up, we can look to this half of the castle, and it's worth noting that this totem will give the invader one skeleton in this rampart for every unit killed. So unfortunately, there are two skeletons over here, which is certainly going to make our life harder, and now we can look to this segment. Now the invaders have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 defense. So that means no damage happens, and it certainly would be nice to have enough offense to start killing off these units, but unfortunately that has not uh, happened for us just yet. Now we can move on over here. It looks like the invaders have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 damage coming in, and as far as defense is concerned, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that means the invaders do two damage, but again, uh, it takes three damage to kill off a veteran, so we are good enough to have no units killed off here. With the melee phase done, it's now time to come to the hospital, and we did build another bed, but it looks like we didn't need it. Uh, we can pull back up to three units, and only two died, so they're going to head over here to the courtyard. And it's now time to evaluate the panic track. Now it's up here on the one slot, and that means we have to randomly pull one card off of the stack, and it looks like we hit Loss of Faith. Now this has an immediate effect, and it says that the invader chooses and places one Perturbance token on any one of the priests. Now a priest with a Perturbance token cannot give orders, and giving orders is uh, doing speeches which increase our overall morale, and also lets those priests banish the vampires. Now down here it says you discard that perturbation token when you shuffle this card back into the panic deck. So this means the invader can effectively make one of our priests worse for one round. And they've decided to put it over here next to that priest. After that, the panic level will reset. This means we can move the round token over and all of these spells will be reset and ready to use in the next round. And then all of these activation tokens will be pulled off of the board. Next up, we can pull all of the hourglasses off of the completed action spots on the board. And finally, we can return the white temporary tokens, so the saint token will head back over to the cathedral. Okay, let's start off the next round with a supplies phase. We can see over here that the invader is going to get just one mana from the supply, and we will get two more time tokens. After this, the invading player can choose to draw a mana card, and they've decided to go for it. Now this one is simple, it's just going to give them one extra mana. Next up, they can activate the Altar of Death if they want to, and they've decided to go for it. So this means they're going to get rid of four units from this. That is going to give them two more mana to play with, and of course we get one time because they activated the Altar. Moving on, the invading player has decided they want to activate the Necromancer's Tome. That means we are going to get another time token. And then they're going to bring in two more of these red spells. Now they have to replace previous spells, and they have no more tokens for the Path of the Damned anyway, and the same is true for the Marsh. So they're going to get rid of both of these, and then add these down, and they could rearrange these spells, but at the moment they're still feeling pretty good about this arrangement. At this point, we can now use our four time over here, and realistically I would love to have more, because things are starting to look a little bit scary out there. Well, I think the first thing we should do is spend two of our time to put another trap out. I think this should go right over here, because if these units were able to get into this area, we would be in some pretty big trouble. Now, if our opponent does a double maneuver, they could bring some of these over through there, but at least that would give us a bunch more time to try and react to that. Next up, let's spend one time in order to send this veteran back to that spot. And then with this last one, let's construct another wall, and I think we should probably put it right over here. This means the supply phase is done, and we can now move into the preparation phase, and the invader is going to start by casting some spells. The first one they want to do is a poisonous cloud. That's going to cost them just one mana, and they can put the third of these tokens out. And it looks like they think we are pretty vulnerable over here, so they're unfortunately going to put the poison cloud down onto that spot. Uh, this is starting to look like a really scary part of our defense. Now that did give us one time, so I think let's put this over here. That way we can try and get our fourth and final veteran into the mix. Moving on, the invader decides they want to cast Mists. That lets them put the second of these tokens out, and that is going to cost them two of their mana. 
with this, they've decided to go over to this rampart, so it definitely seems like they are uh, scaling up their assault on this part of the castle. Well, that did give us two time tokens, so let's spend one of them over here, and that will let us train the soldier into a veteran. Now we can uh, put one of these down somewhere else, and of course these will clear out. And I think that perhaps we should spend this just moving this veteran over to that hole in the wall. Now another thing that we maybe should consider is getting another priest trained up. We currently only have two, and having them add two defense and having them be able to banish the uh, phantoms and potentially banish vampires as well is certainly something to consider. Moving on, the invader is now going to cast Aid from the Cursed Forest. Now this is going to cost them just one of their mana, and it says they can either place a vampire or they can place a phantom and a skeleton onto each foreground. Well, vampires are certainly good, but the invader feels like they want to be a little more flexible, so they're going to go with the skeleton and phantom option. Well, we do get one time to spend now, and I think we should start working on another Skeleton Cauldron. Realistically, we probably should have been getting these out a little bit earlier, but uh, let's try and fix that now. Alright, the invader is going to move on and cast Old Friends Return. Now this is going to cost them two of their mana, and that lets them put four skeletons down into one of the empty ramparts. Well, they're going to put them down right over here, just like last round, and I think we should probably respond in the same way as last round. We can put the two time we just got from that into sortie, and that will remove three out of the four over here. Of course, these three will go back to the altar of death. Next up, the invader, unfortunately, is going to cast totems again. That lets them put this out onto the board, and it will summon one skeleton for every defender that dies, and that is going to cost them one mana. Well, it looks like they have their eye on this area once again. They're going to plant that over here, so now they have a totem on either side of the castle, which seems to be a pretty good way to spread our defenses out even more. Well, that is going to give us one time, so let's go ahead and finish another skeleton cauldron, and I think we should put it right over here. Next up, they have the option of casting Cursed Bats. Now, that would put this token out, and when it's active, it allows the invader to push one defender uh, away from that wall segment and back to the courtyard. Now, of course, we would have the ability of moving that unit back over uh, as long as we actually have the time for it. So Cursed Bats could really be a problem. Uh, it would, of course, cost us time, or if we don't use that time, we could potentially just lose the game without having that defender on that spot. Now, if they spend the two mana on this, then we will get two time, and they will only have one mana for activation. And they've decided they think the activation is probably more important, so they are not going to cast Curse Bats this round. This means it's now time for activations, and with one of their mana, they are going to activate all three of their marshes. With another mana, they are going to activate two of their poison clouds. And then for this mana, they're going to activate one mist. So that mist is right over here. The poison clouds that they activate are over there, and then of course all three marshes are activated. This means the cemetery will not get activated, so that's not going to hit our panic track over here, and now it's time for them to go into the grounds phase. So this means they simply get two mana for each one of their activated marshes. That's going to be six mana total, and once again, their cemetery does not activate. So they can put these right here. And it's now time for the maneuver phase, where they can draw 14 more units out of the bag. So these are the ones that they find and they can now choose to do a minor or major maneuver. Well, when they consider they currently have seven units in each of the foregrounds, they've decided to go with a major maneuver, which lets them move up to eight units from each rampart first, and then the foreground, and finally the camp. So they're gonna start with the ramparts, and this rampart over here is gonna have a phantom move down that path and head over to this levitation spot. Now they cannot fit any more skeletons into this area, and they could walk both of these skeletons over there. That would cause uh, four damage to them, so both skeletons would die, and this trap would go away. So they are considering it, and they figure that considering one of them would die to the Consecrated Ground anyway, they may as well do this. So they're going to move this through. That is at least four damage worth of units, so that can happen. This trap will go off, and that's going to kill off both of these skeletons. Next up, they're going to move up to eight from this rampart, and unfortunately, both of these are going to head down to this wall section. That is getting pretty dangerous. Moving on, this rampart could send this one skeleton out, but if they pushed it down here, then their two strength would meet four strength and it would die, so they're just going to leave this over here instead. Moving on to this rampart, there are two units, and they're going to send both of them over here. Now we know that these phantoms are levitating, so they can take up those spots in the middle. Lastly, this rampart has three skeletons on it, and they've decided to send all three down to that wall section. 
Next up, they can move up to eight units from each one of the foregrounds. And they've decided to simply send all seven of these down this path onto that foreground. Now, as one of these phantoms crosses over that path of the damned, that means it is going to turn into a skeleton. Next up, over here, they're going to send one phantom down this path, and they've decided not to convert this into a skeleton because they actually want it to stay levitating. Now, after that, they're going to move the rest of these down this path over here, and they are going to turn one of these phantoms into a skeleton. So that'll head right onto that spot, and at this point, they can now bring out eight units into each one of the foregrounds. Well, they've decided to send four phantoms and four skeletons to the top right, and then they'll send two skeletons, three phantoms, and three vampires to the top left. At this point, the invader has decided they want to do another maneuver, so this one has to be a minor maneuver. Now, before we go into that, though, I just realized they sent eight units over to the spot, and only seven can go there. Now, they've decided instead of uh, sending the eighth one here, obviously they have to put it somewhere else, and it would have gone all the way over to this path. Sorry about that. Now they can work on their minor maneuver, and this lets them move up to six units from each one of the ramparts. And they're going to start over here by moving these two down to that wall section. Next up, they're going to activate this rampart, where they can move six out of these seven units. Now they've decided to send all of these right over here. Obviously there is a unit cap of five, but one of them is a levitating phantom. Now you may be wondering why they didn't send their other vampire to this spot, and that is because these stakes exist, and we could potentially put it down over here. Now again, the way this works is we could sacrifice one of our units, and then destroy all vampires from one given spot. So if they sent all three of them over there, I think it would be a guarantee that we would make that the plan. Now we still might actually do this, but uh, either way, that has finished out this rampart. So they can now move up here, and they've decided to start by sending this one phantom to that location. They are going to send another skeleton down that path as well. Next up, they still have four movement left, so they're going to send all four of these down that path, and things are certainly getting hairy in pretty much all of the uh, different spots around our castle. Next up, they've decided to send this phantom down that path over here, and that finished out their ramparts. This means they can now move up to six units from each one of the foregrounds. And they have decided to send three phantoms down this path over here. Now one of these is going to be turned into a skeleton, and they can leave that right here. And then they have three more movements from over here, and that is probably going to be two vampires and a phantom, which will head down this path over to that rampart. Next up, they can do the same thing up here, and they're going to send two of these phantoms down that path. Uh, they've decided not to turn uh, either of these into a skeleton because they want to keep that levitation ability. Next up, they've decided to simply take four of these skeletons, and they're going to move them down this path over to here, and they have now finished out this maneuver. Now at this point, they can activate their missed tokens, and they have decided to use this one to grab this skeleton. They can bring it over here, and then they can push it out over into this rampart. Now they also have a missed token right over here, and they're going to use that to bring in a skeleton, and then they're going to push out this phantom over to this location here. Well, after all of those maneuvers are done, we get eight of these time tokens to use. And when we look out to the walls, we can tell that these two segments are uh, really not protected enough. If we did not do anything, then either one of these would actually cause us to lose the game. So we definitely need to spend our time tokens shoring those up. Well, I do think we should begin by spending two time to build a stake. Now that can head right over here, and we can sacrifice this uh, marksman right here to destroy both of these vampires, which would negate, it looks like, seven damage coming in, which is a significant portion of this damage overall. Now if that happened, we would still be having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven damage coming in, and our overall defense would be one, two, three, four. So that would be three damage, and we would still be losing over here, so we have to keep working on this spot. And I figure maybe we should spend one of our time to pull this soldier over to that location, which should really help things out. Next up, I think let's spend two time to activate repellents. Now this is one that we have not actually used so far in this game, and it lets us repel up to four phantoms from any one wall section back to their associated rampart. So let's target this area up here, which is going to repel all three of these back to the rampart. And that has reduced the damage coming in here by six. Well, at this point we are no longer losing the game, and we have three time tokens left over, so maybe we should try to shore up some of these positions a little bit better. Well, I think let's maybe use this inscription ability down here. Now that's going to cost us two of our time, and that lets us put an inscription down onto the table. 
Now this will occupy one of these empty spots over here at a wall section, and it also covers up all of the levitation spots. Now this removes the levitation ability from any phantoms in that wall section, and we can see over here that this means there are six units in this area, and there can only be four, so that means both of these phantoms will head on back to the rampart. At this point, we have one time left, and I think let's use it to send a marksman down to this location down here. Alright, the time has come for the assault phase, and we can begin with the defender ranged weapons. Now this cannon can target any one of these three spots, and I figure we'll target this rampart, so we can flip over the top card, and it's a miss. Well, there's just one of those in the deck, and it was, I guess, uh, likely to happen at some point, but that was certainly unfortunate. Now we do have one more cannon on the other side of the board, and I think we should have it target this rampart. So we can draw the top card, and that can kill a phantom or a skeleton, so that's going to take a phantom out of the spot. After that, our crossbow can activate, but it looks like, again, the invading player has made sure there are no vampires over on this side of the board for us to hit. Next up, it's time for the invader siege weapons. This bone thrower is going to miss, which is certainly good to see, and then this one is going to hit. Alright, so that means that this is going to get shuffled back here into that siege deck, and then after we can do that, we can of course have two bone piles come down onto the board. Now the invader has to look around and see what the best spot to target is. And they've decided they don't want us to continue to use Malfunction. Obviously we did not get it used this turn, but now it's going to be even harder to use in the future. Now they can move on to activate their Ballista, which has not actually succeeded in a hit yet. Uh, they're going to target this area right here, and that is still a miss. Wow, this Ballista has not really done much for the invading player so far this game. Now before we move on, there was one hit with a siege weapon, which is going to increase our panic by one. So it will go up to one. Next up, it's time for the Marksman's Volley, and these two can kill one of these skeletons, so they will. Well, it's now time to go into melee combat, and the first thing that happens is each of these priests that is not already activated will repel one phantom from that zone. Now, there's no phantoms over here, but there is one on this spot, so that phantom will head back to either one of these ramparts, and they're going to send it to this one. Next up, it's time for all of the skeleton colgents to activate. This one will kill off a skeleton, and so will the other one. Well, we've now reached the stake part of the round, and for the first time in the game, we can use this. Now, this means we have to sacrifice one of our units, so that's going to be a marksman. And then with the stakes, they can go over here and defeat all of the vampires within this wall segment. That appears to be our only stake, so now it's time to go into melee combat in each one of these areas around the board. Well, I figure let's start down here and go clockwise. Now, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4 defense. That means we are going to take one damage, and that's going to kill off one marksman. So we can now move on to this location here. Now there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 defense. That means we are taking three damage total, and it looks like the invader does want to knock out this veteran. Next up, we have this segment, and there is 2, 4, 6, 7 damage coming in, and we have 2, 4, 5, 6 defense. That means we take 1 damage, and that's not enough to kill either of these soldiers, so we don't lose any of these units. We can now move on to this spot, where there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 defense. That means we take 2 damage, and that's going to kill off one of our soldiers. Moving on, this area has 2, 4, 6, 7 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 defense. That means we take 2 damage, and that's going to kill off another soldier. And then we can come down here, and there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 damage coming in, and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 defense. Uh, that means we can lastly come to this spot, where there is 6 damage coming in, and we have 2, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7 damage. So I think for the first time in the game, we have more strength than the opponent, but that 1 damage is not enough to kill any of these skeletons. So once the dust has settled, it looks like four of our units died, and unfortunately that means each of the two totems will spawn four skeletons. So four will appear over here, and four more will appear over there, and now we can evaluate the hospital, where three of these four will survive, and unfortunately for this marksman, I don't think they are going to make the cut. Alright, it's now time for us to move on to the panic phase. It appears we are going to draw one card, and we start by getting rid of this loss of faith card, or at least shuffling that right back here. This perturbation token is also going to be removed, and we can randomly pull out a new card, and this one says panic in the buildings. 
Now it is an immediate effect, and it says the invader places a perturbation token on the buildings of their choice, uh, and we as a defender cannot use these buildings uh, that have that token. Now we can spend two time to remove that token, and we will discard that token back to this deck once we reach the next panic phase. Now this is obviously really bad for us. And the invader has decided they don't want us using this scout building over here. Of course, we can use it. It'll just cost two more time. So the panic track will reset. And it's now time for the cleanup phase, where we can move the round marker over and refresh all of these spells. Next up, every one of these activation tokens can be removed. And then we can pull off all of the time tokens that are on completed actions. The last thing we would do is return these temporary tokens, but it looks like we did not play either of them in the last round. Alright, we can now start the fifth out of a potential eight rounds in the game, and the first thing that happens is the invading player will get no mana. Now we can see if we're able to keep surviving into these future rounds, then the invader is actually going to have to pay mana, or if they do not pay that, then we get uh, hourglasses for each mana they don't spend. Now in this case, they don't have to pay anything, but they also don't get any perks, and we are going to get two time tokens. Next up, the invading player has decided they are going to draw one of these mana cards, and it's pretty simple, that's just going to give them one extra mana. Now at this point, they can activate the Altar of Death, and it looks like a lot of skeletons have died. Now there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and they are going to activate this and remove 8 of these, which is going to give them 4 more mana. Next up, the invader can optionally do a Necromancer's Tome action. And it looks like they do want to do this, and they're simply going to change out Poisonous Clouds for Bone Giant. Now that's going to head right over here, and they could rearrange the order, but once again, they're pretty okay with how this order lays. Since they activated the Tome, we get one more time, which means we now have four time that we have to spend at this point. Now I figure let's spend two of this time, first of all, to go to the Saint. That lets us put this token out onto one of the ramparts, and this is the rampart for us. Now we can see there are just a ton of units over here. It's maxed out at seven. So by putting this over here, the invader will not be able to move these units out of that rampart this round. Next up, I think let's spend these two time to build our third and final skeleton cauldron, and let's put it right onto that spot of the wall. All right, we can now move into the next phase, which is preparation, and that means the invader can start activating these spells. Now the first one here is Bone Giant, and they are going to activate this, which is going to cost them 2 out of their 11 mana. Now what this does is they can choose any wall section with at least 2 skeletons in it, and they actually stack one skeleton on top of the other, which forms a Bone Giant. Now that Giant is still treated as a skeleton, but it now has 4 strength. So they can use the mana and then tilt this over, and then down here they've decided to create a Bone Giant. So that is going to stack up like this, and of course that also takes up one less of the unit slots, so they are looking to be much more powerful over here. Perhaps we should have sent the Saint token to this rampart, but I think either way we are in some trouble. After that giant is created, we now get two time to spend, and I think we should probably spend one of them adding a wall section to this area where that giant just formed. After that, let's spend this time to do half of what we need to train a new priest. Now this lets us take any of the units in the barracks to turn into a priest, and of course there is a separate slot for the priests, so that should help us out with defending some of these wall segments. Next up, the invader could put another mist token out onto the board, but they've actually decided to save the two mana. So they are now going to skip over to this one, and they are going to spend one mana, and this is aid from the cursed forest. So this lets them put down a vampire into each foreground, or they could put down a phantom and a skeleton into each foreground. In this case, it looks like they have opted for the Phantoms and Skeletons. This means they've used that spell, and we do get one time to spend now. And let's go ahead and use this to train a Priest. So that means these are going to clear off, and then one of these Marksmen will turn into a Priest token over here in the barracks. Now it's worth noting that we only have a maximum of four Priests, and I'm starting to think that maybe we should have done this earlier on in the game to make use of these Priest open slots here on the walls. Next up, the invader is going to cast the Old Friend's Return spell. That is going to cost them two of their mana, and they can now put four skeletons down into one of the empty ramparts. Well, they currently only have one rampart that's empty, and that's this one over here, so those can get added onto that spot, and then we of course get two time tokens to spend. Well, I think we should probably start deploying some of these units here in the courtyard. 
Now we can see that we have open slots in all three of these wall segments that also have uh, the invader units on them. And this spot is looking pretty scary, so let's spend one of our time to send a veteran up to that location. And then we can spend the other one to send this soldier from the courtyard up to this wall. Next up, the invaders can now cast totems. That's going to cost them one mana, and they can now put their last totem token out onto the board. After looking at their options, they're going to put it down onto this empty spot at this rampart, and now we get one more time token to spend. Well, it looks like we are currently really weak in this bottom left area, so let's spend that time to send this soldier down to one of those open spots. It looks like the last spell is Cursed Bats, and the invader has decided they want to cast this this turn. But that's going to cost them two of their mana, and they can then put one of these out with an activation cube on top of it. After looking at their options, they're going to target this wall segment, and I have been kind of overlooking this. Uh, we are currently in quite a bit of trouble here. That's two, four, six, seven strength coming in, and we just have three defense happening. So uh, considering this is now probably going to scare a defender away, we definitely have to do something about this before the melee assault. Now we do get two time tokens to spend, because that is what it costs to get the cursed bats out. And let's go ahead and spend one of these to move this new priest onto that location there. Now we do have one time left over, and I think getting our fourth priest out is probably a good idea, so let's put that right over here. Alright, it's now time for the invader to do some activations, and they have three mana available. Now they're going to spend one of these to activate all three of their marshes, they're going to spend another one to activate all three of their poison clouds, and then they're going to spend the last one to activate both of their mist tokens. Obviously, that is quite a bit of activation for just three mana, so now they can put this out onto those tokens. And it's now time for them to activate their grounds. Now, this cemetery is once again not activated, so we will not suffer any panic from it. But then all three of their marshes are activated, which is going to give them six more mana to play with. Okay, it's now time for the maneuver phase, and the invader can pull out 14 more units. And it looks like they are pretty skeleton heavy this round. Next up, the invader can do maneuvers, and they are going to start with a minor maneuver. Now, this means we are going to get three time to spend after they finish this out, and they can now move up to six units from each rampart. Now, of course, this does not affect that rampart with the saint token down on it, so now they're going to look up to their other options. Over here, they're going to begin by sending both of these phantoms to that wall area. And then over at this rampart, they're going to send a vampire down here, as well as a skeleton. So that's filled out the five invader spots for that area. But there are two levitation spots left over, so they're going to bring both of these phantoms down here as well. Now there is one skeleton remaining on this spot, and they're going to move that one down into this area that is now filled up to the max of seven units as well. Next up, they have this rampart that has four phantoms on it, and they're going to send two of them down to this area. And then the other two will go to the other wall section connected to that rampart. Next up, they have this rampart, and of course they don't have to do these in this order, but that's just the way it's happening this round. Now they're going to send all four of these skeletons down to this wall segment that up to this point in the game had been relatively quiet, but now it looks like we are being assaulted at every single spot out here around the castle. Moving on, this rampart has three skeletons in it. Now they've decided to send one of them over here, which will fill that area up to its capacity of five. And then they've decided to send both of these skeletons down this path with a trap on it. Now this is four strength worth of units, so that's legal, and that's going to blow up the trap so it goes back over here. These skeletons do die, but that has cleared the way for more units later on. Lastly, they have this rampart with six units on it, and they've decided to send three of them down over here. That has put this at capacity, because of course this bone giant consisting of two skeletons is just one unit. Now they can send the rest of these out as well, and it looks like there is slots available here for two more regular units, and they can also send a levitating phantom to this area. Next up, they can move up to six units from each foreground out, and they've decided to send all three of these to that rampart. And they could upgrade this phantom into a skeleton, but they do not want to do that because they want to make use of its levitation ability. Next up, they're going to send two of these units over to that rampart, and then they're going to take this one and move it down this path and not upgrade it because, once again, they want that levitation ability. 
Lastly, they can add six more units from the camp to each foreground, and now, before we can spend our uh, time tokens, the invader player can use their Cursed Bats as well as the Mist. Now, the Cursed Bat is going to activate, and it's going to send one of our units back to the courtyard, which really makes this a very vulnerable spot to the castle. And then each Mist can bring something in and push something out. Now, they are not going to bring anything in over here because that'll just die to this consecration. But now they've decided to send this one down onto that area here. Next up, they have one more mist, and that's going to pull in a vampire. And then it's going to push out a phantom over here. All right, we now have a measly three time to spend, and we are in a lot of trouble. When we look out to the walls over here, three of these wall segments would instantly put us into a game-end condition if we were to evaluate them right now. As we can see in this area, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 defense. And coming in, there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And that is, of course, not including two of these skeletons that will get killed by these cauldrons. That means there is a total of 9 extra damage coming in over here, and currently we can only absorb 4 of it. So we can go ahead and spend 1 time to activate this priest, and that will let us banish a vampire. So that's going to banish this one back, and the invader chooses which rampart it goes to. They're going to send it over there, so now it looks like that has reduced the overall damage by a significant amount. Now I suppose it is worth noting that this priest is going to banish one of these phantoms once we actually get to the melee round. So now we can see that the damage coming in is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now our defense is still 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's 3 damage, so at this point we are not going to lose the game in this wall section. Next up, we have this section, which could also kill us. This has 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 damage coming in. Now we currently have 2, 4, 6, 8 uh, defense, so that's a total of 9 damage coming. And we do have stakes over here, which means we could sacrifice one of these soldiers in order to kill the vampire. Now that would of course lower our strength by 2, but it would lower the invader's strength by 6 overall. Unfortunately, in this case, they would still be doing 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, 10, 11 strength compared to the 2, 4, 6 that would still remain with the 2 soldiers left over. That would be 5 damage, which is enough to kill off 2 soldiers and have 1 damage left to actually end the game. So uh, this situation is pretty dire over here, even with the stakes. Now one thing that we can do is spend 1 time to finish training a priest over here. So let's go ahead and do that. This will convert that marksman into our 4th priest, and then we can use our last time to move that priest over to this location. Now that's going to add two more strength, and it will also banish one of these phantoms, so that makes us safe over here. But unfortunately, we are now out of time, and we are still very much not defending this tiny little section over here. The invader really made a huge push in this area this round. Obviously, the bats scaring off a marksman was certainly not a good thing, and we currently have 2-3-4 defense compared to the 2-4-6-8-9 attack coming in. Now, unfortunately, as I just said, we are out of time. We had to use that three time to just barely shore up these two locations. So unfortunately, I think that means we are going to lose the game. Now, obviously, there are several steps that we can do technically before we get to the melee phase. But as we can see at this point, there's just nothing that we can do in those steps to actually stop this from happening. The cannons and crossbows will not be able to take out any of these. Obviously, the priest will uh, banish one phantom, but that's still more than enough damage to overcome these defenses. So with that in mind, unfortunately, there's just no reason for us to go through the rest of the steps. We can see that once we get to the melee phase, there is going to be a massive bloodbath going on. We can survive on a lot of these fronts, but there's going to be a lot of death, which is going to summon a bunch more units onto the totems that are out here on the board. And obviously, we did not defend this area, which means that is enough damage for these undead units to breach through these walls. Uh, that is inevitable at this point, which means, unfortunately, as the defenders, we were not able to protect this castle all the way through the night. We only lasted, it looks like, five total rounds, which is not great overall, but that's going to be the way this game of Stronghold Undead ends. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough, even though it was not terribly close there at the end. Obviously, as the defender, we would have won if we survived eight full rounds, and we died somewhere in the middle of the fifth round of the game. Now, I think there are uh, several reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that we were just getting over the main uh, power level of the undead player. Uh, if we went into future rounds, they would have to start giving up their mana, and it is true that they get less and less mana as the rounds go on, but for the first few rounds of the game, they kept building up marshes, which means they actually had even more mana to play with as they kind of built up their overall infrastructure. Now, if we were able to survive into the 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th rounds, I feel like the undead player would have become much more hamstrung with the uh, reduction in their overall mana. Now, they could, of course, not spend that mana, but that would turn into time that we could have used to better reinforce our overall castle. Now, I think the main reason that we lost this game is because I am not very experienced with uh, Stronghold or Stronghold Undead. In fact, this was my first full playthrough of the game. Uh, now, because of this, I feel like we did a lot of things that were not terribly uh, good in the long run as the defending player. Uh, in particular, I think we should have spent a lot more time early on in the game upgrading our units. I don't think we ever won a single battle in the game that resulted in an undead unit being killed, and that would have really helped things out. Now, obviously, in order to do that, we would have had to have uh, more strength than the undead player, and that happened a couple times, but we never had enough to actually kill off a unit. So I think if um, in the beginning of the game, if we had spent more time uh, tokens in order to train up more soldiers and obviously more veterans early on in the round, then I think having them out there deployable on the castle walls for the uh, second round, is, which is really when the attacks started, uh, maybe we could have started killing things right away, which would have helped us keep the overall uh, levels of units down. Obviously, if we are killing the undead units, then they are not killing us, so that would have also been good. Uh, I think there are probably 20 other uh, spots that we probably uh, could have done things differently. Uh, I really feel like we could have uh, gone much deeper into the game and potentially won this one if we had uh, played it a little bit better. But again, I am a novice to the overall system, uh, so this is, I guess, uh, an example of what Stronghold looks like uh, when played uh, with relatively new players, because obviously I hadn't played either side before. Um, now, it did seem like it was uh, pretty challenging to deal with the, uh, the tide of undead units that were just coming uh, over and over again, and there are some pretty nasty spells that the undead player is able to uh, wield against the defending player. Uh, but again, I think there are a lot of smart things that we could have done that did not actually happen in this play to really help mitigate those overall. So at the end of the day, I am sorry that I wasn't able to show a more competitive game here, uh, considering we lost so easily there in the fifth round. But uh, yeah, this just shows one way that Stronghold Undead can go. Obviously, uh, finding down hordes of undead is going to be hard in uh, any circumstance. And unfortunately, it looks like we were not able to overcome that challenge today. All right, well, I think that's going to bring me to the end of all of my thoughts on this play. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you could do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.